and always will, is about moving humanity forward. And remember, folks, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Hey, folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing, forget about it, Bad Brad Berkwood. And you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Now, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Bad Brad RSR. Again, it's at Bad Brad RSR. And check out my great writing team on ringsidereport.com. Well, today, folks, I have a very special guest coming on. And she is a writer, producer, director, and I call her an activist that I really became aware of with her recent fantastic documentary, The Game Is Up, Disillusioned Trump Voters Tell Their Stories. And I put that out on Twitter. It is a must-watch documentary. So without further ado, forget about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to my show, Melissa Joe. Peltier. All right. Well, good afternoon, Melissa, and welcome to the show. Very, very happy to be here. Thank you. We got a lot of talk about today, but I always preface all of my 360 conversations with this. If I have something wrong in my notes, because we know the internet is not always correct, say, hey, really? Brad. Say, yeah, exactly. Say, hey, Brad, it's actually this. I'm not offended by that because I want my interviews to be as factually correct as they can be. Good, thank you. I'm a big fact person myself. There you go, exactly. So what I want to do is we're going to we're going to get into a lot of different areas, sure. but I want to start at the beginning because it's going to be about you and your documentaries and, and all of that. So it looks like you were born in Boston and raised about 15 miles west in a little town called Wellesley. Wellesley. Wellesley, okay, Wellesley. Yeah. Talk about... Talk about That's growing up. College, there. Wellesley. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talk about growing colleges up. Colleges in that town. Okay. Talk about growing up there. Um, you know, it was. I grew up during the good years. You know, when we we really didn't lock our doors, and we really, you know, the kids just walked to school by themselves, and and uh, you know, we I used to walk to school along this brook path. Um, I mean, it just. It was a really, really safe town. It, it's sort of a, um, my parents are both librarians. So we sort of lived in like the poor intellectual section of Wellesley. It was actually a pretty nouveau riche kind of town with some old money also. Um, so I guess, you know, being not rich, uh, I guess I really never felt in, I fit in with the culture there. But I have to say Wellesley High School, I had an incredible education there. I came, I went to college and I, had a better education in some aspects than people who went to Choate. Um, and I just, I'm so grateful that was public school back then too, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was excellent and uh, far above what we have now. So, you know, my husband and I both say, we're just so happy that we, and fortunate that we grew up when we did. I mean, what we had to go through with my stepdaughter, you know, with safety and schools and stuff like that, it's, it would never have happened in the the place I grew up, but it was a um, it was a beautiful place, and I got a great education, and we lived in a little renovated farmhouse, and and uh, I had a great childhood, really good. And we came here to, to Cape Cod. We came to Cape Cod uh, every August. And okay. We rented a teeny little cottage, and uh, my husband and I in 2018 bought kind of a combination between a cottage and a house here on the beach. Okay. It looks like you went to Pomona, Pomona College in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. Graduated, how do you say it? F uh, go ahead and say it. Oh, Phi Beta Kappa and right. cum laude. <laughs> right. With, with a BA double major in English literature mm -hmm. and creative writing. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Plus a minor in theater. Yeah. I, I had gone in as a theater major to begin with, but um, the the devotion you needed to give to the theater, to a theater major in college was really all consuming. And I actually wanted to learn other stuff too. So um, that's why I switched the majors. Okay. Talk about that time in college in your life. Uh, I just, well, I love learning. You know, I mean, I'm a nerd. I'm just a total nerd. I love learning. I love classes. I love studying. <laughs> I love researching. I love deep dives. Uh, and um 
I wish I could have gone to graduate school after, but you know, like people now, I had a loan, but my loan had very low interest and I could pay, I paid it off within five years. So it's not like now, you know, when people's interest is so sky high that they can't even begin to chip away at the principal. Okay. I'm going to talk about, I want to go into um, the primetime documentary special you did called Scared, Silent, Exposing and Ending Child Abuse, which looks like it was hosted by Oprah Winfrey. Is that correct so far? Okay. Uh, it looks like it was released about nine, 1992. It said the document, what I found was the documentary earned you a, a how do you say it, Humanit Humanitarian Prize? Mm -hmm. Okay. And two, two news uh, and documentary Emmy Awards. Um, and then later on, you directed and wrote Breaking the Silence, Kids Against Child Abuse, which right. won, it looks like a Peabody Award. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with those two, um, with that subject matter, what I was curious about, what made you want to cover that particular subject matter and put them in a documentaries? Well, I think, you know, I had always wanted to go into drama um, because fiction and writing plays and things was my, my thing. But in the entertainment business, as I'm sure you know, as an actor, <laughs> you, um, you, you can't really, there's no, there's no like ladder to success unless you're an agent, you know, where you start in the mail room and then you go to the assistance desk and then you go to the first assistance desk. It's not like that in any other aspect of um, entertainment. And I just sort of drifted. I didn't, I wouldn't say drifted. I, I started doing documentaries literally when I was in college um, as I was an intern on, on a film in, um, in LA. And I it just got really hooked on them. And I got hooked on the the, the type of stories you could tell. And at the time, I was really social justice motivated. And my mentor, who's the guy who did, do you remember Scared Straight? Yeah, John Walsh. No, 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 no. No, Scared Straight was when they went to the pr prison with the juveniles. Right? Right. Well, the guy who did that um, is Arnold Shapiro, and he's my mentor. And okay. he hired me to do those two films with him because we're very like-minded in terms of, you know, trying to leave the world a better place, especially for mm -hmm. kids. And he- I, I remember those well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He also did Rescue 911. He produced Rescue 911. Okay. Okay. And, yeah, because uh, I remember- a director. They did, if I remember correctly, they did one early, I want to say in the 80s, they did a sketch but they came back years later and did another one. I don't know if you're aware of that. Did, did you know that? Yeah. Okay. Did, yeah, I did. yeah, it was a series. He did a scared straight series um, at the, toward the end of his career. He's retired now. Okay. Uh, but I, I think, I can't remember what year it was. I know I was in high school, I think. Okay. I was in either junior high school or high school. No, I think I was junior high school when it came out. But um, but I remember it really well. I remember sitting and watching it with my mom. Yeah, they yeah, were powerful. It was, yeah. And it's so funny because if you knew Arnold, I mean, I just can't imagine Arnold in the prison, but <laughs> he's just a really colorful guy. And uh, I wrote a novel called Reality Boulevard. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the main character in that book is based on him. Okay. Martin Which I'm going to get to. I have that in my notes. We're going we're gonna to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. Um, it looks like another documentary you did. You were the writer, producer, and director of an a and &E documentary, Titanic. Death of a Dream, and, and the Titanic the legend lives on. Is that correct? Right, right. It was four hours. Um, the first two hours were Death of, of a Dream, and the second two hours were Legend Lives On. Okay. And that was um, that was a, a news and documentary Emmy for writing. Okay, talk anyway. about that. Talk about that. Um, well, it's funny because when I was in fifth grade, I, I know I was obsessed with the Titanic, and I did all the research. And then I had this option. Um, uh, Michael Cassio, who was then the head of a &E programming, asked uh, a company that I worked with frequently if they would produce it and if they would bring me on to, you know, to do it. And so I was thrilled to do it. And I have, I have some great photos that uh, I want to start posting them every, every April um, 12th, because um, we went to all the spots, you know, we went to where it left from, we went to Liverpool where it was made. I mean, sorry, yeah, we went to uh, Belfast where it was made, we went to Liverpool where it stopped. It was really great. I mean, we 
we talked to the last surviving um, Titanic survivor then. And then I had interviews from another documentary that this company had produced that I could use of the survivors before they had passed. It was from about 10 years earlier. And uh, it was, it was, I tried, I was not allowed to use any reenactments. So it was really a challenge um, to kind of bring it to life without using reenactments. But we did, we did, we, you know, we had pretty much every possible still you could have of it. We had some models, we had, um, you know, sound, a lot of sound effects. And we had uh, some wonderful voiceover people reading, you know, the quotes from people about the Titanic. Okay. Out of curiosity, did Cameron ever contact you when he was making a movie about anything? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, he his office called my um, my agent and asked for a copy of the documentary, which we gave him. We were all excited. And then um, I think if you watch the documentary and you watch his film, you could see some echoes. He certainly used every one of our experts as consultants. A lot of them were in the film with cameos. Oh, okay. Um, and then years later, I ha I did a documentary called um, for. Was it Discovery? Who was it for? I can't remember right now. Oh, the Sci-Fi Channel, I think. Okay. I think. But it was called, <laughs> I can't remember, but it was called, um, it was this War of the World 60th Anniversary. And um, I asked James Cameron to host it for me <laughs> as an exchange, and he did. And it was great. C correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't War of the World, that Orson Welles thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did a the documentary, you know, for the anniversary, and um, he did the hosting of it, you know, stand up hosting. There's not a lot of that anymore, which I have to say, I think I'm kind of glad because you always sort of had to, it, it, you always had to jump out of the narrative to put the host in. So I, I'm kind of glad that's gone out of style, but who knows, it'll probably come back. Okay. Now you obviously, I'm going to make this assumption, have a love for dogs for, oh. Now, on my end, it's saying internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it's a little, it seems a little loose. Um, you know, it's very windy. Okay. It may be on your you. side or mine. Can sure. I can still hear you. Yep, I can still hear you. And I see someone in, in your mirror. You were frozen. Say that again? What? Uh, no. Is uh, uh, yeah, I'm having, you're, you, you're like. In and out? Yeah, anyway, um, just go ahead and ask. Okay. In and out, yeah. Okay, well, I'll wait for a delay. Hopefully it's not too much delay. Obviously you have a love for dogs. Yes, of course. Okay, yes. so you worked with- animals. I've always been obsessed with animals. Uh, obviously. You did You did the stuff with uh, Cesar Milan, is that how you say his name? Cesar, right, yeah, I, um, I had a company He's in Milan. Correct. Uh, the Dog Whisperer. Yep. And yeah, um, I had a company uh, in LA that did that did uh, that kind of show, and um, we basically created the the show um, uh, with two other uh, producers, Kay Sumner and um, Sheila Emery, who really brought us the idea, and they brought us Caesar, and. He was, you know, right out of the box, pretty amazing to see him work is just amazing. I mean, it is amazing. We, we learned um, in our first episodes were so low budget and they were half hours each. So we had to do two segments in one day and we didn't have anything. We didn't have a porta potty. We didn't have a, a mobile home, anything. So we'd show up with Caesar and we learned very quickly that if you showed up with Caesar, the dog would not do the bad behavior. Hmm. That, that he would just instantly stop doing it, no matter what it was. Okay. And so we had to always have, you know, we would go in with the team and we shoot the bad behavior and then we bring Caesar on much later because you'd never see it. <laughs> I mean, for, it, it's like they just recognized an, an authority somehow, you know, they, they knew that he had their number. And um, a lot of people have problems with his methods. Um, his methods really are pretty universal. You know, I mean, he does use physical touch, but um, he kind of, he basically caters to the, uh, the, um, the dog itself. 
And so we worked with him. We did um, 10 seasons of The Dog Whisperer, which was exhausting, but really fun. And it was such a good, it was really hard to find a show, and it is now, then, um, to, um, uh, you know, really feel good about, you know, I feel like you're really making a change. And we would get so many great letters from people. And that was so encouraging. And then I also, um, when the show started to get popular, we started writing books and I actually wrote, co-wrote um, with Caesar five of his books. Okay. Five or six, I can't remember. I got to know five. I got to know here it says five, yeah. I think it's six, actually. Okay. Yeah. All right, folks, we had well, some technical difficulties, but hopefully we get back through it. Okay, now you froze on your end. Can you hear me? Okay, there you are. I did. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. So we left off on something that we both love talking about dogs. <laughs> so you were talking about the dog, the dog whisperer. Is? Yeah, and the books. You had the last thing you said before we got cut off. With, oh, you wrote yeah. six books with yeah. co authored six books. Right, right. And, um, we did a whole lot of other stuff um, when we were we had Dog Whisper. Now, um, the I actually still co-own the Dog Whisper brand, um, and we actually have a new Dog Whisper, but but we um, haven't been able to do anything about it. But uh, we have some products out there. One of the best products, actually, that we have is a flea and tick shampoo and, and spray. Um, it's a you can Google it. I think it's for sale on um, Amazon. And it's so good. I mean, I we are just inundated with ticks here. Both my dogs have had tick-borne diseases, and and uh, it's so good. It, it's night and day. So that's our. We have other products too, but that's the one that for me I use that every day here. Okay, it's very good. All right. Also in research, you I found that you and your husband. Your husband is John uh, Gray, correct? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. It looked like you produced and he directed an award-winning movie, Two Irish Drinkers. Oh, you froze. Uh, um, uh, white uh -oh. Irish Drinker. What's that? It's White Irish Drinkers. Okay, I'm sorry. Why, okay. Talk about, now, you produced and he directed it, correct? Uh, he, do, he writes and directs, yeah. These, uh, he wrote and directed it. And I produced it, that was back in 2010. And um, we did very well. We got in the Toronto Film Festival and we were released on um, in theaters briefly. Uh, but, um, it, you know, it was an independent film. We made it really cheap, really cheap. <laughs> and, uh, and very fast in 19 days. And it was the first time my husband and I had worked together and we just didn't know how we would work together. And we actually had such a good time that we always work together now. Um, we make a lot of short films together. Okay. Well, I was looking at the trailer and had um, Stephen, how do you say, Steve or Stephen Lang, who's one of my favorite character actors from way. Oh, was, he, he's a wonderful guy. He's like fantastic. In fact, um, we have him, we really want to work with him again, but he's just one of the best people you could ever meet. He's so cool. Okay. And it, and it looked like it took place in about 1975 Brooklyn. Is that correct? That's right. It's uh, basically, you know, the, disguised autobiography of my husband's childhood uh growing up in in that kind of neighborhood and also being like artistic and not feeling like you totally fit in okay next i want to get into you had mentioned a little bit earlier your book if oh, you right were, yeah for the viewers give them a synopsis a brief synopsis of your book uh reality boulevard it's a novel and it's a it's basically it's, it's lifted as a satire of, of Hollywood, but it really is, <laughs> most of the stuff in it actually happened. I mean, in some way or another, it's very fictionalized, but some of the conversations that sound so crazy and, and exaggerated actually are as I remember them. Um, it was sort of my swan song to reality TV, which I think is really bad. And I think reality TV has actually contributed to everything that we're going through now as a country, uh, the lack of um, decency toward other people, uh, the kind of fetishization of the, the bully you love to hate, um, the, the, basically the, the 
ethos that um, anything goes to get what you want. And that's been, you know, always there in American business, but I think it never was as widespread as it's become when you see, you know, people throwing wine glasses at each other's faces every week. It, it, it normalizes it. It normalizes really bad behavior and really bad people. And I started seeing that, um, well, back when I wrote the book, which is in 2012. Uh, and, um, you know, here we are today. Okay. Hey, everything you just said, can, can you hear me? Can you hear yeah. Me? Okay. Everything you just said, I just had Lydia Cornell on uh, Thursday because she was on Too Close for Comfort. And we talked about reality TV and how it is hurt society and it just and that was gotten out i you, you're preaching to the choir i agree with every every word you just said okay what i want to get into next area is your most recent project and that's why i definitely wanted to have you on the show i tweeted out for my followers and viewers to watch every second of it because it was fantastic Thank you. yeah Thank I, you. you're quite welcome and, and fantastic work the game is up Disillusioned Trump voters tell their stories. Right. Okay. You had one of my buddies on, Joe Walsh, who was always good. He's, you put a mic in front of Joe, he never shuts up, which is great. No, he's, he's great. great. He's great. He's, he, he's, but he tells it like it is. And he yes. tells, he tells his truth. And he's a guy with a lot of integrity. And, um, you know, he watched, in fact, he inspired the documentary because in 2017, he was the beginning, he was very rah rah Trump. Uh, he's got a famous uh, tweet from right before the election, you know, if Trump loses, I'm bringing my musket to Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, as he watched Trump in real time, I remember thinking, why aren't people getting this? Why aren't people getting how, I mean, you know, the Muslim ban, the first week he was in office. Uh, I mean, it, it, people, it, it was horrible. And one thing after another, and Trump, he would sort of apologize for Trump here and there, but every once in a while he'd say, wait a minute. You know, he was really upset at the fact that Trump was trashing the FBI. Um, and, you know, and agree, and he, what really put him over the line was when um, Trump went to Helsinki and sided with Putin over our, whatever we have, I can't remember how many, I think we have nine separate intelligence agencies, yeah. all of whom agreed a thousand percent, plus private, I mean, I. I know people like Alan Silverberg, who's in the documentary, private citizens who do sort of hacking stuff, you know, they cybersecurity. Um, they all knew it was the right question. Mm -hmm. knew it really early. And the fact that he sided with Putin was like a slap in the face to patriotic Americans. And I think that that pushed Joe over the edge. But what was interesting for me was watching in real time on Twitter as he as he sort of figured it out. And I thought he'd be the canary in the coal mine that, you know, more and more Republicans would do that. It turns out that they did, uh, certainly not in Congress, but they did do it um, throughout the country. And we looked for sort of a cross section of people. Um, we didn't have a lot of time. We didn't have we had no basically no money. I mean, we had we raised about forty thousand dollars to make it. Um, and then the rest came out of my pocket, but, um, I just, it was a labor of love and I couldn't have done it without, um, Mary Carrie Craven, who was my producer and, uh, our co-producer and editor, Marilis Ernst, who is just a super talent, amazing, super talent in so many ways. And the three of us really, you know, after everybody got off, after the sort of the first cuts got in and approved, um, the three of us sort of just took it over the finish line over over about a year. And um, we finished it. We wanted to finish it by the 2020 election, but we couldn't. We didn't have any money for posts. So we ended up doing our posts overseas, which was very slow. And um, so we were able to get one of the stories out right before the election and one out right after. But uh, it was the Bacha Goldberg story. Um, she was a rising star in, in the teenage Republicans. I mean, she used uh -huh. to go to the Turning Point events and there's pictures of her with Charlie Kirk and Ben Shapiro and all those people. And um, she was a true believer until Charlottesville. So yep. what, what I wanted to do with the film was to show that, first of all, 
you know, not every single Trump voter was a horrible racist person. People had very different reasons for voting for him. We all vote generally for our, how things affect us personally. And I think that ended up changing a lot of people. Um, the fact that, that it was affecting them personally. And when she saw uh, what happened in, in Charlottesville and Trump sort of defending the white supremacists, she, Jewish and she was very upset and her parents were uh, refuseniks from Russia. They were Russian Jews who, who couldn't get out, couldn't get out and finally got out uh, around the time that perestroika happened and became American citizens and just cherish America and what it offers them. And they, her whole life have told, been telling her, you know, this is what life was like under totalitarianism. This is what it was like. It's terrible. You don't want it. And you know, if you see that signs here, do something. And suddenly she was seeing the signs and she couldn't deny it anymore. And so that was what another one of the stories. But we eventually completed it about uh, late spring, I think. Um, late spring 2020. Mm -hmm. No, 2021. And um, we started on the, the festival circuit and we got we did very well in festivals. Um, we got, I think, 22 top awards, but we also got um, uh, barred from a bunch of festivals because we were considered too controversial. And to be honest, well, you've seen it. It's not a controversial film. It's just people- It's the truth. Yeah. The truth today is controversial. You yes. know, it's, it's ridiculous. But it's really just people telling their stories. Their stories. And, you know, and we didn't, we shot during, um, uh, COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. We shot Joe Walsh and he was in Iowa and New Hampshire. And then we were getting ready to go to Ohio to do our next story, which is with an Ohio farmer named Chris Gibbs mm -hmm. and everything locked down. And we were just, I was personally paralyzed. I, I didn't know because I, I just come from a very old tradition of documentary filmmaking where you, you're, you know, the whole point is for you to be there, you know, and observing. And I was like, how can I do this? How can I do this? We talked about renting a mobile home. And we 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 had a, like a bunch of different ways. We had it, we put together a kit we could send to people to record themselves and that didn't work out. And um, we finally basically hired one man and two man band crews locally. And then we tell the person we were interviewing, how are you comfortable with them in your house, in your yard, on your porch? Uh, in a park, you know, we, we shot in a lot of different places. Some people were just fine, like Joe and Helene Walsh were just like, fine, he can come in. Uh, but, and it was a one-man band there. But um, I was on the other side of the camera, but I was on a laptop. It was Zoom, we did it through Zoom. Right. So it was the first, <laughs> first time, and actually we wouldn't have been able to afford to make it if we'd done it the traditional way. So, and, and, you know, accidents happen sometimes, Sometimes when you have to come up with creative solutions, they're better than the original. Right. So let, let me ask you some, off of some of your talking points. Uh, first, before you made the documentary, looking at your tweets, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so you, I'll let you answer it. But obviously you didn't care for, I, I don't want to use the word disdain, but you didn't care for Trump before you ever shot the documentary. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, First of all, everybody in New York knew who he was. Right. Everybody in Hollywood knew who he was. And I had lived in both worlds. And I had spent a lot of time, not a lot of time, but I would say I'd been to Mar-a-Lago at least half a dozen times um, because I was making a film on Palm Beach. And actually, believe it or not, Trump was like one of the good guys uh, of that film because he had just moved to Palm Beach and he just made Mar-a-Lago a club. Uh, he just started dating Melania. And it was... Right about the time, I, I remember he was making his first golf course, and, and I think it was right about the time when he started getting the Russian money to launder through his real estate. And so he was he went from nothing to suddenly flush again and with very little change in, in his business. And he was buying all these golf courses with cash. And, and there was the first one was being built in Palm Beach, and you know, he invited us out there and I have to say he was incredibly gracious but that is Donald Trump he wants something from you and he had didn't have the apprentice then and he didn't have a lot of cameras around him and he 
love being in front of the camera. And what, what struck me about him was not that he was a bad person. I didn't see that at all. What I saw was a, a kind of a weak person. I saw a very, very vain person and somebody whose ego, you could manipulate him by his ego very easily. And that to me, even before he said, you know, came down the escalator and talked about Mexicans, uh, even before, I would say even before, you know, he did the, the Bertha thing, um, I just like, this isn't a person who, who should be president. Right. Somebody that eagerly yeah. manipulated with that kind of a, an ego, that kind of narcissism, that's really dangerous. And right. I, that was my first thought. And I still feel that way. Okay. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think it's, it's now out of control because he has been president. Mm -hmm. And the truth is the guy has been a criminal for years, but he skirted the law uh, and nobody's done anything about it. And that's, you know, part of my, one of my crusades is um, fraud is part of white collar crime, which actually costs the United States far more than violent crime, far more, like billions and billions and billions of dollars. And nobody does anything about it because it's, it's considered like, you know, well, it's white collar, but it's also, it, you know, it's basically people think of it as businessmen stealing from other businessmen. Right. So it's, like, ah, it's fine. But it's not. <laughs> it's not. I mean, when, when Donald Trump spends 10 years not paying any federal taxes, none, zero, you know, changing his his uh, financial statements, he's got one for the loans, which is really high, and one for the taxes, which is like nothing. Uh, when he does that, the country loses a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And part of our problem right now in America is that billionaires just don't want to pay taxes. And they have internalized the fact that having billions makes them better than the rest of us. So they shouldn't have to pay for us. And it's, it's astounding to me, especially since if you have billions and Trump, I don't think has billions. I don't think he ever did, but, but um, he, it, it, he probably had it on paper billions, but that's a little different. Um, but it's, I, frustrated by that. I mean, the fact that there are billionaires at all is something, but I'm not, uh, you know, if you can earn a billion, billion dollars, honestly, more power to you. Great. But even $1 billion is, I, I was looking this up the other day. I think it's, um, I think it's, if you spent $5,000 a day, uh, you would, it would take you, well, no, I, I think if you spent $100,000 a day, you would have 25 years before you ran out of money if you had a billion dollars. And these, these people don't have one billion. I mean, they have hundreds of billions. So imagine, I mean, this isn't even talking about generational wealth. Right. This is talking about generational wealth that can't even be spent in generations. And uh, a lot of these guys don't think they're going to die too. <laughs> you know, they're all into cryogenics and, and, and uh, right. Yeah, stem cell stuff and you know they're it's it's really bizarre the whole billionaire culture is just so strange right but i don't i don't you know i love capitalism i don't i don't deny anybody making money but capitalism needs guardrails because greed is a human i mean read the bible for crying out loud <laughs> greed right. is right across there Absolutely. and um, it's a human quality and it's it's, it's an Quality and some animals actually are fair than than humans, um, well, especially when they where they're uh, pack oriented or herd oriented. They they take care of each other better, I think, than humans do. And probably because there's so many of us in our society is so uh, just complex. It's incredibly complex. And but it's not. I mean, these people own like eighty percent of the world's wealth. And good for them but how many islands can you buy right right you know how many islands can you buy can you buy an island for you know refugees and they can live on an island until they can come i don't know. but but why do you need two islands why do you need four yachts um not even need why do you want right why do you want that many i mean that's i i think it's like a mental illness i think it's extreme wealth hoarding is a mental illness it's like an addi addiction it's like uh you know, drug addiction, alcoholism, whatever. Okay. You had mentioned, uh, you had, can you hear me? Can you still hear me? 
Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned uh, Bachi. That was to, to me, her part was the most compelling. It was most interesting and fascinating watching her and, and watching her come around and being Jewish because on my father's side are Russian Jews. Mm -hmm. And the whole uh, Charlottesville thing is, is, such, is so hypocritical of him because you know this very well. His grandkids are Jewish. She married the daughter married Jared. Right. She converted to Judaism. So he's a hypocrite. Right. To say they were fine people right. because they were walking with tiki torches, screaming Jews will not replace us. So I could see how that could open up her eyes. So when you were shooting a documentary, either while you were shooting it or when you had all of it in the can, did you have a holy shit moment? Like, wow, I didn't realize this or this was really shocking. Was there anything in there that like, wow? Good question. Good question. Um, well, I remember, you know, Bacha actually in her interview, she said this is as an aside. And I was like, what? She said that the, you know, the head of the um New York, was it the New York Republicans or Brooklyn Republicans, I can't remember, called her because she had a reporter had said, you know, what do you think about what he said in, in Charlottesville, what Trump said? And she said, Well, you know, my club and I were very disappointed in that. And she immediately got a phone call from the Republican Party saying, you can't say that. You can't say anything negative about Trump ever. And she's like, what? You're telling me what to think? And that was, again, that's one of those signs of totalitarianism that, that her parents had warned her about. So, I mean, she was very, very Republican in everything she did. But uh, her eyes were so opened by that because if Republicans have become now the party of, of uh, you know, white supremacy and purging immigrants and purging people of certain nationalities or skin colors, uh, then of course, you know, she, she was a smart girl and she yes. changed. And she's now in college in, um, in Israel. Okay. And I don't know what she's going to go into, but whatever it is, she's going to be extraordinary because she's just a brilliant, brilliant young lady. Okay. And I want to talk about Helsinki for a minute because I don't know if you can see behind me my shadow box. I was in the military for 20 years and 28 days during War and Peace. So when Trump said that with, thank you, when Trump said that with Putin, I know it's a funny line, but I seriously meant it. They should have left his bloated ass over there gassed up Air Force One, flew back to the States. I don't know if they could 25th Amendment him on that, but they should have started the process to, even though I can't stand Mike Pence, they should have removed him from office because to me, what he did in Helsinki, and I'm not over-exaggerating it, for as a military man, I think Dan Coates was in the front row, if I remember correctly, his jaw hit the mm -hmm. ground. Everybody couldn't believe it, but he got away with it and nobody thought anything about it because the MAGA party, as as President Biden says, and I agree, double down, mm -hmm. you know, we got Republicans now and not Republicans, really. Russia, Putin's a great guy. Russia is great. As much as you could dislike the Republican Party from whenever you decide you like it, don't like it from Reagan, from whoever, Eisenhower, wherever you want to go with it. But the thing that I will say, take the policies aside, Reagan, Papa Bush, the last, Bush Jr., None of them, in my opinion, would have ever said, at least publicly, that Russia is not a threat to us. He did it, and it was treason. So when Joe, because I've had Joe on my show, and we talked about that, sure. yeah. um, and Joe and I feel the same way. I, I never like. I didn't like Trump before that. I didn't like him when he attacked John McCain. I thought it should have been over then. But I'm a veteran. You still have veterans for Trump. I don't. I don't understand. And, and I, don't, I don't have any respect for any veteran that's for him because you we took an oath and you don't honor your oath. And when you went to the Capitol on January 6th, you defecated on your service. You should no longer get any VA benefits. And I argue with liberals about this because they want to cut slack. I said, stop cutting slack. What they did was to overthrow an election that was not stolen because Trump said it. So the Helsinki thing, I wanted to touch base. I just wanted to come back with that point. The Charlottesville, where you mentioned, because she's Jewish, they had opened her eyes. People forget how hypocritical he was with his grandkids being Jewish. So the other thing I want to ask you about the documentary, since it's come out and it's got a lot of views and it's got a lot of people talking, have you been attacked by, and I call them the MAGA party, 
uh, whether it's through emails, whether it's through them getting your cell phone number or uh, snail mail or anything like that? Uh, actually, no, um, but I've always been attacked by them on social media. Um, in fact, uh, some Russians, I don't know who they were, but they were definitely Russians, shut down my, my website and I lost my like web domain early on when I started just commenting, you know, in 2017. Um, so every, I think everyone, especially women, has been harassed by these people, everyone. Um, there's a lot of really harassing comments, I think, on the, on the YouTube site. We're on Tubi now, by the way, too. We're also on Tubi. So there's two ways to watch us. You can watch us on Amazon, which would be great if you could watch us on Amazon and please leave a review. And you can watch us on Google Play and that's without commercials, both of them. And then we have uh, AVOD, which is streaming with ads, which is gonna be more and more popular. I think you'll see over the next couple of years. Uh, and that's on Tubi and also on YouTube. So you have four ways to watch us. Okay. If you could take one thing, because there were so many great stories, and I don't want to give away too much about it because I sure. want them to watch it. Um, but if you could say one thing through the whole documentary when people get done watching it, that you hope that they take away, if they're open-minded, no matter what side they're on, what they would take away from seeing your documentary, what would that be? Uh, there's actually two things. I think one is for liberals to understand that not everybody was a raving maniac, racist, anti-Semitic person who voted for Trump. People had their, Trump was able to say things in such a, a way that people were able to project what they wanted onto him. And uh, I think that a lot of liberals really discount that. They discount that people also are in a bubble and they're not getting the information. But secondly, um, I really, I wanna teach people how to change their minds, to give them permission to change their minds when they're presented with new information. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you should change your mind if the information you're presented with contradicts what you think and it's factual. And the fact that we can't even agree on facts right now I mean, a congressman this morning on Twitter just posted something about how, you know, people are dying from the vaccine. And it, a congressman posted this. And it, it's insane. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. And yet there's a huge swath of people who believe it. And I have people in my family who, who are pro-Trump. And um, it's, it's astonishing to me. You know, it's really astonishing to me. Uh, but... So I wanted to I wanted to be the beginning of a conversation between the two sides. I think maybe I'm a, I was a little naive because I didn't really believe the polarization would go to the point where they actually would deny a pandemic. I mean, that it's astonishing, and, you know, that, that where they'd actually believe the election was stolen, even though sixty courts, many of them with Trump appointed judges, just threw people out of court, that some of his lawyers are losing their licenses and facing charges because they lied in court about it being stolen. You know, they, they presented stuff that they knew wasn't real evidence. It was bullshit. Um, it was bullshit. Yeah, the, the facts are there, you know, the facts are there. And Fox News, and uh, another documentary I recommend is by my friend Jen Senko. Uh, it's called um, uh, The Brainwashing of My Dad. Okay. It's a really great documentary about how um, how Fox and Limbaugh and the, the right wing media how they basically have literally brain, brainwashed a lot of people. You know, m a lot, most of them parents or whatever. But but uh, it it does work as a brainwashing tool when you hear something over and over and over. And they're, they're very, very good at repeating a message. Yeah. And I wish the Democrats would get better at it. I wish we'd yes. get better at yes. fighting. I yes. think we're a little better at it now, but I don't know. I don't know if we're, we're good not, enough. We're, not, we're nowhere message, near. You know? We're nowhere near where we should be. Messaging kicks kicks the crap out of them. And they, you know, these right-wing nuts, just they eat up the news cycles. They eat up the clips. They eat up that. Let me, let me ask you this. Take yourself out of the documentary 
take yourself out of a uh, 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 politics just as a as a as a person a human being would you ever think that in 20 it was 2022 that this country would see the likes of a Donald Trump I know I know he was president in 2017 but ascend to the to the highest most powerful position in the world being the way that he was would you ever think that No, I, it was it was a shock to realize so many Americans wanted to hear these things, and I I really didn't know. I mean, I knew, I knew that there was a polarization, but the fact I I really didn't realize how much liberals had become dehumanized by by right wing radio, and that that is what scares me. Radio and TV. I mean, I, when I remember reading on actually a friend of mine. Uh, on his Facebook page before Trump, um, you know, liberalism is a mental illness. And I'm like, what? You know, it's liberalism is based on the enlightenment. And that's what inspired our founding fathers was the idea of classical liberalism, not being a liberal, but classical liberalism, which means representation in government, basically, and, um, and individual rights. The fact that individuals actually have rights, that was sort of new when the enlightenment started. And how could you be, how could you say that? And this is a very, very smart guy, but he's very right wing. And, um, and he even made a comment, I remember in, um, on his Facebook page at one point to some of the other right wing people when Trump was running. And he said, you know, maybe we shouldn't be getting behind a guy who is this unstable. But then, you know, I think he just joined the crowd. And, and that was another thing with the film. I was really hoping that there were a lot of people who went to bed with knots in their stomach because some of the things that Trump was doing and saying, but they were afraid to say anything about it because they're in MAGA bubbles. You know, everyone around them is well, saying- Well, your couple, Trump, your couple, I don't uh, want to give too yeah. much away, but your couple in it, he knew, the gentleman knew, the husband knew this wasn't right, but he'd still voted and then he felt terrible afterwards. But he knew in his right. mind that this something's right. not right. This isn't right. But I gotta, I gotta go, I gotta go with the I won't say flow, but I gotta do this. But the minute he did it, he yeah. felt he felt remorse. That was yeah. powerful yeah. too. I don't that was very powerful too. Their their testimony. Well, I just think a lot of people, I think a lot of people do have gut feelings like that and they suppress them. And you know, that's what caught a uh, uh, cognitive dis dissonances. You can't bear to think, oh my gosh, you know, Trump is doing these bad things and I'm supporting him. So you have to, you have to do practical logic in your head to make the bad things okay. But that's what's scary is the numbing of America to violence, to hate, to all these things. I mean, it's just all normal. Yeah. It's, it just, and, I have to say that um, mass media, and this is something I've been saying since the, gosh, the 90s, mass media is not liberal. The liberal media is one of the foundational lies that the Republican Party has been saying and has, you know, worked in their favor because that was sort of the, the reason behind Fox was everybody else is liberal, we're not. We have a different perspective. But Fox over the years got more and more and more right. And uh, it, the idea that the media is liberal really ended in the 90s when every media company was, you know, came vertical and was bought up by somebody bigger. Um, you know, Sony bought studios and, and decisions are made. I mean, you could look at Hollywood and talk about Hollywood liberals, but the truth is, um, you know, I, I, a lot of the people I know in Hollywood names you would know um just don't want to be political because they're afraid it will affect their their career um i don't blame them you know it you it's very hard you know to to risk losing a career that you spent your whole life building and uh the same thing it goes with news um you know even msnbc is not liberal now its point of view is liberal its brand is liberal but that's a brand. The people at the top of NBC who run that too, 
I mean, people in boardrooms generally aren't people who go to protest marches. You know, they generally they're are money. in the one money. Yeah, they're, they're usually in the one percent, uh, invited by others in the one percent. They're most mostly white, and their their goal is a corporate goal. It's not the the people who run MSNBC do not have an ideology of liberalism. Their ideology is money. Yeah. And it's purely money. And MSNBC gets a kind of a steady audience. So they're like, well, we got this niche covered. Now, before Trump was elected, MSNBC was doing what CNN is now doing, which is going to the right. And they hired, I don't know if you remember, they hired um, Greta Van Susteren mm -hmm. and Hugh Hewitt, and they fired a couple of people. They're going to fire Lawrence O'Donnell, who's super popular. Yep. Uh, and what happened, the reason that stopped was because when Trump was elected, suddenly Maddow shot to number one. And they're like, well, you know, this is a niche we really need to, to hold on to. But, you know, you just go across the way and look at NBC and you're going to see a very different perspective. Right. And what the media does is it normalizes uh, everything that's been happening that is very not normal. You know, it's not not normal in a democracy to have half the country, well, a third of the country believe that a, an election was stolen. I agree. When there's agree. zero proof. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's so difficult to, to reach people this way. And, you know, my, I always advise people to, to just ask questions because, because of cognitive, cognitive dissonance, there's this thing in cults called um, thought stopping techniques and they're, they could be chants, they could be body movements, they could be sayings, hymns, whatever. Um, and you mean, they, Trump, you mean a Trump rally? You just named everything in a Trump rally. Exactly. Well, there, there are things that if you start questioning on one level, you can just turn to and it will shut that question down. And it's it's that's how it works in your brain. It basically just shuts that down. It shuts down part of your frontal lobe, which is the, you know, the, the more rational part of your brain. And it, it just goes right over to the, what the thought stopping techniques are. And that's what Republican talking points are. They're thought stopping techniques. Mm -hmm. And so if you ask somebody without emotion, what they mean by something, and you just keep asking and keep digging, you know, and don't get defensive, just ask, just be curious. Uh, Usually you get to the bottom of the talking points and then you're going to see somebody just not have an answer. And I always feel like even them not having an answer there is planting a seed somewhere because you just never know when that's going to be echoed in their lives. And, and it might go, oh, yeah, you just don't know. I mean, people get out of cults every day, as, as uh, Steve Hassan, who's our cult expert in the film, says, who's amazing. And... They do, and the way they get out is usually there's a small crack, small doubt that gets in, gets past all that. And once they run out of talking points, you're, you've gotten past it before they walk out or scream at you or whatever. Uh, you've got that moment, you've got that, that split second where their mind is like, oh shit, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and then that's that's the that's the time to start planting seeds. Doesn't mean anything doesn't mean you're going to get success, but it's the only way to get through to people who are really indoctrinated in a cult. And it absolutely is a cult. Okay. Before we segue to the second half of the conversations, this fun, random questions. Sure. I want to ask you one more question. Yes or no answer yes. from you off the top of your head. And you obviously thought about it already because everybody's thinking this, this question I'm going to ask. Do you think that Trump is going to be indicted on anything and be held accountable, yes or no? Do I want it or do I think it? Do you th well, we all want it. <laughs> do you? And I don't mean thinking like classified, declassifying documents because he thought about it. I'm talking about the real thinking. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so. I, you know, I want to think so. I want to think high, more highly of Merrick Garland, but you know, just recently reading. Uh, more and more about what really happened with the Mueller report and how it got sidetracked and and how it was really sabotaged from within. I mean, Rod Rosenstein was part of that. 
and we were all looking for those people to save us really. And, you know, nobody's coming to save us. Nobody's no. coming to save us. No. And so we can't, we can't put, you know, the, the, the superhero cape on anybody. And I just don't know if Merrick Garland is strong enough and has a backbone enough to risk it. And, you know, I, I understand saying, oh, it's going to cause unrest. But the truth is there's going to be unrest anyway. And there's going to be unrest anytime Donald Trump doesn't get what he wants. Yep. And anytime whoever the Republican in charge is, whether it's DeSantis or whatever, doesn't get what they want, there's going to be repercussions. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, do what's right for democracy, follow the rule of law, that's it. And, you know, it's, it's amazing when you talk to people about the documents, you know, from people, it's amazing because- They don't care. You know, you'll, you'll yeah, well, you know, you'll hear that, they, you know, we'll take the scrapbooks, it was, you know, they were his, it was- his I know, yeah, I know, I know. I and, dealt this. I dealt in this world for over twenty years with mm -hmm. a clearance. And if anybody that that I talked to that has handled classified material, including myself, would be already indicted and locked up. The, the case would the trial oh. would already be done. But because it's Donald Trump, he gets every and this Judge Cannon. Don't even get me started on her. But okay, I I, I kind of thought that you would would answer oh. with the question. I mean, answer I should say. Let's do this. Let's segue into these are just fun random questions. Whatever you. You say is the right answer. Sure. What is sure. your favorite genre of movies? Um, I think I like psychological thrillers. I think that's my favorite. Okay. And my husband and I watch a lot of horror. We've actually made now um, three, we've made three horror films. Uh, and um, it's, horror is really fun. It's just really fun, but, but you can, um, there's this horror film that I just saw, which is really hard to watch, but I saw it as a metaphor for how Democrats have handled the threat that, you know, against democracy that Republicans have done. I'm sure it wasn't a metaphor for that, but that's how I saw it. Uh, it's called um, Beat No Evil and it's Danish, it's a Danish, uh, Dutch co-production. Okay. I think um, it's on, but it's called Speak No Evil and it, it, it's, really kind of horrifying, especially at the end. Um, I was not expecting the end. I was really shocked by it. But I just put, put uh, there's two couples in it and the Danish couple, I would say would be the Democrats and the, uh, the Dutch couple would be the Republicans. And, and the Dutch couple is giving them warning after warning that there's something, they're doing bad things and these people are refusing to see it. And I just feel like so many people in America have normalization disease. Yeah. And one day they're going to wake up and we're going to have a completely different type of country. And they're going to say, really? I, I never thought that would happen. Yeah. yeah. And even people who are, who are rooting for it now will suddenly, I mean, look at, I, here's the example. Authoritarians never, ever have loyalties. Never. So look at how many people in Putin's inner circle have gone out windows lately. Yeah, no kidding. Exactly. Look at, look at, look at, I mean, of the 300,000 people they're calling up, you know, many of them over 60, uh, how many of them voted for Putin? How many of them supported him? Probably a lot. Probably most of them. And did he care? No. No. It's even if, even if the, the authoritarian is like your guy and he starts out with, putting away the people you hate, you know, and, and doing all the things to the people you hate that you felt like should be done to them, he's going to eventually get around to you. Yeah, of course. That, is, that happens everywhere, every authoritarian. And this is the problem with people who don't read history. Yeah. This, it, it's, you know, it's right out in front of us. And uh, it's, it's really sad. I mean, my mother um, was, she was a silent generation. My dad was, uh, he was a, the greatest generation. My dad was a little older and he was in World War II. And um, my mother was extremely liberal and she was very affected by the Holocaust. Her father um, was a journalist and he went overseas. And I don't think he was there at the liberation of one of the, I mean, he was embedded with some of the, the troops there, but 
I don't think he was there at the liberation of one of the, the camps. I don't know. And she's passed and everybody in the family's passed. So I can't get an answer now. But I believe um, he certainly was there soon enough to see what happened in the camps. And he told my mother and it, it, it really stuck with her. And she told me all the time growing up, you know, you have to be on guard against this. You have to be on guard against this. She was really sensitive to anti-Semitism. She was just so sensitive. And we grew up in a very waspy town. My mother is very, she was very waspy, <laughs> but she was also very liberal. And she was terrified of any, any anti-Semitism. She would just like go jump down your throat. Good. Um, same with racism. I mean, it was, you know, it was the seventies and it was, it was a, a good time to be a little kid, I think. But, um, but at the same time, um, you know, I think my mother made me so sensitive to these cues, like, you know, in the early nineties, feeling like, uh oh, the media is now going to be owned by like six companies, which is what happened. And feeling like, um, you know, even with Trump, like this guy can't be possibly, he's, he's too compromised. Even if he wasn't compromised, somebody with that kind of an ego becoming your president, falling for flattery. I mean, Kim Jong-un sending him love letters. All of those guys had his number. I know. You know it's all, 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 the, all the other oligarchs and, and, and dictators, they were laughing at him because yeah. they had his number. But then, but then you have Bridget Gabriel, which that's not her real name saying how he was the most respected president ever. I'm like the drugs that you do or the bubble you, the, the games you play. Okay, let me let me take you back to the, like, the random ones. What is your favorite TV show of all time? Of all time, that's tough. I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe The Wire? Okay, good one. Good one. Okay. Do you have a favorite musical band? Um, do I have a favorite? That's always hard too. I always like Steely Dan, but that's my okay. generation. Yeah, Steely Dan is good. That's fine. Okay. Um, most memorable childhood memory that pops in your head? Gosh. Well, you know, I'm sitting here just down the street from the cottage I used to go to every summer. Um, I can see it from my bedroom window. And really all my memories of being here is in, in childhood, just with pure happiness, you know, year after year, every August was just like joy. It was incredible. And uh, I was really fortunate to have that experience because back then, you know, two librarians could afford to rent a cottage for a month. You know, it was a bare bones little tiny cottage, you know, something like, you know, 400 square feet or something, but we could afford to do it because it was affordable. And all the people around us were, they weren't, you know, none of them were filthy rich. And it was a, a different time. It was a time when you know, there really was a middle class and you could live a middle class life. And we did. I mean, my parents lived a very middle class life, even though their salaries were you know, bordering on lower. <laughs> okay. My dad, actually, my dad was a professional librarian. So he actually ended up, as he went along working for the city of Boston, he ended up making some good money by the end of his career. But, um, you know, when I was growing up, it was always, do we have enough? Literally, do we have enough to heat the house? Are we going to, you know, are we, is the phone bill going to be paid? That kind of thing. So um, coming here was like, it was amazing. I mean, it's just so pure and you just get up in the morning and just have fun. Go to the beach, ride your bike, you know, go into town. It was wonderful. Okay. So that's my best childhood memories being here. Okay. At the Cape. Do you have a favorite noise or sound you like to hear? Well, I would say right now, I really love hearing the little bells I put on my, my dog Franny's collar. Um, she, she's, get, she's getting a little old. She's nine now. Um, she still can really, you know, run. <laughs> and she, no, thank God, not as, as well as she did before. But, but um, I put bells on her because she's prone to run after a critter. And if there's no road around, I like to let her do it. But I want to know where she is. So when I hear her little bell, that makes me happy. Okay. Now flip that, least favorite noise or sound. 
Hmm. That's tough. I mean, I'm, I'm not somebody who's really bothered by fingernails on a chalkboard, but I suppose you, that would be one of them. I don't have anything that, that uh, jumps out at me. Okay. Do you have a guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Well, my husband and I, um, actually, no, my, you know, my current, I started doing that. What, what's it called? Like Zillow, you know, looking at, looking at like dream houses that you can yeah, never Zillow, have. Uh -huh. yep, Zillow yeah, Zillow.com. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've just started doing that a lot lately. I don't know why, it's, but it's very relaxing. It's sort of like mindless. Okay. What is the first job you ever had? My very first job was when I was 14 and I, my dad, you know, movies were still on film then. And uh, my dad had taught me how to run a 16 millimeter projector. And I went around to like a couple libraries and, and groups showing movies. And the show was Roots. And that was a long, it was a mini series. So it was really long. And uh, I did a lot of that when I was 14. I mean, I was paid in cash, so I didn't have social security. But when I was 15, I got a job as a cashier. Okay. At, at a supermarket. And that was my first job. Okay. So this isn't a question on paper, but since you mentioned that your parents were librarians, how many do you think watching our show today when this goes live on my channel would know what the Dewey Decimal System is? I don't know. I don't know. When did they stop using it? I don't know, but do you think anybody would know? I mean, of course we know, but do you think the, the much generation, the younger generation would know? No, no, mm -mm. no. Well, my parents knew it. <laughs> I know they did. I know they did. <laughs> my my dad had a, a two master's degree, so he was like, you know, he was he knew his business very well. But he was also a film. He he retired when he was seventy, and. Um, was just traveling for a year and then got bored and then took up a second career of teaching. So okay. he taught all the things he really loved at Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. He taught um, film and the American Songbook and, and uh, all sorts of things that he just loved. That's what he taught for years there, 19 years. Okay. Do you have a favorite vacation destination? Uh -oh. I lost your question. Okay. Yep. And you favorite. froze. Yep. Vacation destination. Yep. Um, favorite vacation well, destination. Pod, but um, that's more like home now. So, oh, I'd I, I'm frozen. Nope. You're on frozen now. You're good. I, I'd, I'd say Cape Cod, but um, okay. Uh, I'm here and it's, it's becoming more like home. So I say Paris. I really love Paris. Okay. My husband and I made a movie in Paris last August, and it was uh, so fun. It was just super fun. Okay. And I, I speak enough French to get by, and I, I always try to take classes when I'm over there and try to level up a little bit. Okay. If you could, could you still hear me? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. If you could meet one person from any time in history, dead or alive, from any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would you either ask them or what would you like to talk about if you met them? Hmm. Let me think. Any time in history. Yep. Dead or alive. I'd like to I'd like to talk to Jesus and and tell him that his teachings have been corrupted and maybe he needs to be a little more specific <laughs> um but uh I, I mean honestly i really i really i was raised christian and i've done a lot of comparative religion study and and read the bible as literature and read the bible and especially the, the new testament which my mother who was agnostic raised me on um and i just i don't see it i don't see it in the christians of america today I don't see anything reflected in what the gospel was supposed to be. And uh, so I would like to, to tell him, you know, maybe he needs to bullet point things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Okay. 
with everything we discussed today, Melissa, if you had to sum up yourself in a few thoughts as a human being, what would you say? Um, I just, I'm somebody who has, a, I think, an overdeveloped sense of responsibility and conscience. And, um, you know, I've heard people talk about, uh, what, what is it, like performative, um, what's the term that people use for liberals? Like, uh, performative yeah, but Marjorie Taylor Greene uses it. Yeah, she says we do that. Performative uh, um, something. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, virtue signaling. Ver right. Yes, yes, it, that's it. And the thing is, it's like, you know, I, I'm sure, I, I, and I've, I've certainly met people because I was very much of an activist when I was younger. Um, and I'm not now, really. I mean, I, I, I don't really, I mean, I, I could be, but I, I would prefer to use my skills instead of protesting now, okay. even though I still, um, but I think um, I'm just somebody who, wants to, you know, wants to leave this world and have done something that's that's going to help it survive. Okay. And that's, and, you know, my most of my career really, except for the child abuse films, uh, well, I did a couple more. I did, you know, like a couple animal rights films and things like that. But, um, you know, later on in my career, actually, really, it was the second child abuse film that just so burned me out. Uh, that I started doing stuff for the History Channel. And that was very, I like doing that. You know, it's good storytelling. It's, you know, it's real stuff. It's fact-checked. <laughs> and uh, you can be creative in how you told the stories. And I think that, you know, for years and years, I, I don't feel like I really did that much to make the world a better place. I think the dog whisperer maybe did, but that's why I did this film, you know, and, and basically emptied out a... Uh, savings account to do it because I had a vision for it and I wanted I wanted people to see that and uh nobody would pay for it so okay we did like I said it, we did raise forty thousand dollars for a pack and and uh we had some really generous donors and that certainly got us off the ground but it didn't get us through post okay final question of our conversation today to always end on is do you have a saying you live your life by, and if so, what is it? Good question. Uh, I have a couple. Okay. But, uh, I think, um, I think do unto others, others, the, you know, the old golden rule, which is definitely a, you know, a, sort of a secularization of um, of Jesus' two commandments, which were, you know, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. I just really think that um, if, if we all approach life treating other people with empathy, treating other people like we would like to be treated, if everybody did that, then we'd have no, we have that's nothing to worry about. We'd all be pretty good, but um, that doesn't really... I don't think it's realistic. Mm -mm. I, I, it's, I, I agree with you, but yeah, it's, it's tough. I think human nature is just, you know, I, I, so I spend a lot of time with my dogs because I just think they're better beings than we are. No, they are. No, they are. I agree. We do too. <laughs> we do too. They're, they're angels, with, angels with stinky poop, I call them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But, okay. But they're, they're really, really great. And, and animals, I love being with animals and watching animals because I, you see what, what we could be, you know, in some ways, if we didn't have this crazy frontal lobe going mad. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good way to put it. Uh, if you would, again, uh, and add to, mention where you, they can find a movie, but also your, other, your social media platforms, but plug sure. the movie, plug the documentary again where the viewers can see it. Okay, the, the website for the movie is uh, gameisupmovie.com, gameisupmovie.com. Um, one word, obviously, and uh, I think that's our, I think that's our Twitter. Oh, we might be Dignity Pack still on Twitter, um, but my Twitter is Melissa J Peltier, P-E-L-T-I-E-R, 
Uh, and um, we have a, also a Game Is Up movie has a Facebook page. Um, and it has an Instagram, I just don't know what's on it. I have Instagram as well. Um, my Instagram is scribemjp, um, but um, my Facebook, I just, it's, that's personal, but uh, you could see the movie now. Okay, Amazon, really great. If you go on Amazon and you could leave a review, that would be awesome. Um, the, anyway, that would be great. But also Google Play. And that's for rent and that's no commercials, the whole thing. Uh, on Tubi, you can see it with ads. I don't know how many ads Tubi has. And then you can see it on the YouTube site for our distributor. And our distributor is Indie Rights, I-N-D-I-E-R-I-G-H-T-S, um, and one word. And it's their YouTube channel. And they have a lot of free movies you can see there, but they, they do have a lot of ads in them. And you know, a lot of people don't mind the ad. Right. So you have you have the option to see it free or to pay for it um, on you know on and see it undisturbed as as we you know we would show it in the theater as we we've done many many times now. Okay, I'm going to close out with a couple of thoughts. I'm going to give you the mic to close out completely. Mm -hmm. First of all, I got to disagree with one thing that you said. It's not an insult, but I got to disagree with you. And it's actually a compliment. You are an activist. You may not be out there protesting with a sign. But you use your, your Twitter platform to retweet stuff, to try to keep stuff factual. And to me, that is an activist because there's different, there's different levels of activism. You're using your platform to push back on what I call bullshit about putting whether and, and giving people things to look at that are factual. Speaking out, because I follow you on Twitter, speaking out and saying things, okay? And it's not always the most popular thing to do. I get attacked by veterans for Trump, which I don't care. I, I, I'm not worried about them. I'm in the book. If they want to find me, you, they can find me. So, are you part of Vote Vets? It was that. Vote Vets. Are you part of them? I didn't, I didn't hear you were breaking up. Say it again. Are you a part of Vote Vets? I think I follow them, but the they're honest, really. I, I have to check. I think I follow. Problem is a lot, and I'm going to be honest. A lot of people that are out here that are supposedly fighting for democracy have their little cliques and they don't work with everybody like they should. I always call them out. You know, I'm not going to call out specific names, but they don't. And my thing is, I'm not competition to anybody. I'm for democracy. My show is about democracy and humanity. So I'm not competition. But unfortunately, some people think they're competition to me or whatever. And I don't, I don't play them Twitter games or any of that. But yeah. I appreciate you making the movie because it's. Thank I, you. it's People, you're welcome. Well, people I really liked it. I mean, it really means a lot when people say things like you, you said about it because, uh, you know, it was a labor of love and a lot of people volunteered, a lot of people who'd never worked on a film before, uh, a lot of incredible professionals worked for like pennies on the dollar based on what they should have been making. Um, and everyone did it because they believed in it. And that was really that made me feel really good. My, That's you know, good. My heart. That's good. Well, you're, like I said, the premise of my show is moving, hashtag moving humanity forward. That's what your right. film is doing. Now, it may not change every yeah. MAGA person's mind, but you know what? If you change one mind of a MAGA person, exactly. then you know what? And, and I'll use a, a Yiddish word. That's a mitzvah. So that's yeah. a good thing. What I want yeah. to do now is, is give the mic back to you, close out with any thoughts you want. Uh, I just, I really hope that, um, you know, it's very difficult when you don't have any money for promotion, when you have a film out. And um, our film was supposed to come out, I think, earlier than it did. But, um, but you know, we now have this time before midterms. So I would encourage some people to, to use it as a, a conversation starter in their family. If they have somebody in the family who is not necessarily pro-Trump, but they don't like Democrats because it, they've heard everything that has been said on Fox News and Rush Limbaugh, which is usually not true. You know, I'm so much, so many myths. That's another film I like to do. I like to do the myths, you know, or the foundational lies of the Republican Party because there's so many of them. And one of them is, you know, Democrats want to take all your guns. Democrats want uh, open borders. What? You know, it's like, no. Uh, Democrats are... Uh, Socialists. I'm a capitalist. I believe in cap. I be believe capitalism and democracy work really well together when they have guardrails. 
Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, and, and most of the people I know who are just like your average everyday liberal are not crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're not Mm -hmm. out, you know, wanting to tear down the world. They just want more equality and more, more opportunity for people across the board, not just at the top. And yeah. And, and, uh, I, I just think that maybe that's a way to, to open a conversation because a lot of the people in the film, well, all the people that we talk to in the film who have stories are Republicans. And then we also have a couple of Republican, uh, experts in there. Um, and it's, it's not a, it's a film about put your country first, you know, I mean, don't, don't get so caught up in your tribe and your, your, your group and your fanaticism for something that you don't hear what's really happening. And that's uh, what I'm, I'm really hoping the film will do. I hope, I think it will maybe spur some conversation. I hope so. I think it will. I think, I think it has a a good shot. If, if if somebody just has a, 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 just open your mind just a little bit, just a little, just a tiny, Mm -hmm. tiny bit. Uh, I think it will. Again, I thank you for coming on today. Let's stay, let's stay in touch. If we could do something together, by all means, let's do it. You bet. You bet. All right. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. All right. Me too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey folks, that's another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. What a fascinating discussion with Melissa about her just amazing documentary. Must watch. So, Listen to what she said, where you can find it at, on the platform that you uh, are used to viewing your stuff on, and make sure you check it out. And if you go to Amazon, make sure you leave a review because it is just that good. All right, folks, I hope that you subscribe to the channel. I hope that you retweet this when you see it on Twitter. And I appreciate each and every one of my viewers all around the world. And a shout out to my BBB crew. All right? And remember, folks, Every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out. Thank you for watching the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. Please follow, subscribe, leave comments, forget about it, and move humanity forward.